Okay, so good evening, everyone. Welcome to the IACS verification seminar. Uh, today's talk will be given by Ram Nathan. Uh, Ram Nathan is a postdoctoral researcher at MPI Germany. Uh, he did his PhD at IMSC Chennai. So he's the recipient of the HBNI Outstanding Doctoral Student Award in Mathematics. So his MSc was at CMI and uh, he did a BTEC in Mechanical Engineering at IIT Madras. Uh, he, he has been working on uh, verification of multi-threaded shared memory programs. And his work has been recognized uh, with the Distinguished Paper Award at uh, Popol and a Best Paper Award at TACAS. So we look forward to listening to you, Ramnathan. Over to you. Um, thank you so much for this invitation. Um, uh, it's great to at least be back virtually with all of you. Um, so yeah, so with that, let's just dive into this. So, so the context is, uh, so this is joint work with uh, Pascal Bauman, uh, who is a PhD student and uh, Rupak Majumdar and Georg Satcher. We are all at uh, Max Planck Institute for Software Systems. Um, and uh, so the context for this talk is that of uh, multi-threaded shared memory programs. So, uh, so let's see first what these are. So as you can imagine, uh, there are these multiple threads uh, which are running and they're communicating via this uh, finite shared memory. Uh, so uh, these kind of programs are you know, found all over the place in operating systems, web servers, databases, embedded systems, and so on. So, um, so let's see uh, what a run of this would look like. So first you have this first thread which runs and then it gives up control and uh, and then you have the second thread, uh, which runs and it also spawns two new threads. And then uh, control shifts to the third thread and then the first thread. So uh, here, this uh, at every time period, time instant, the which thread is going to run. So this scheduling is done in a non-deterministic manner by some scheduler. And uh, this leads to uh, very many different behaviors. In fact, exponentially many different behaviors. Um, which makes it very hard to detect and reproduce errors in such programs. Right? So this is what we call the curse of interleaving. So, um, so of course, we want to know what kind of properties can we decide about these programs, uh, because we, we want to verify properties of programs. And uh, unfortunately, there are well-known classical undecidability results. Right? So, uh, for example, reachability is undecidable. In fact, pretty much everything is undecidable already for just two recursive threads, because you can think of a recursive thread as something which maintains a stack. And uh, as soon as you have two stacks, then you can simulate a tape. And uh, we know that basically nothing can be decided about a Turing machine. So, uh, therefore, we need to place some kind of restriction uh, in order to get decidability. So, for us, this is going to be the notion of context boundedness. And in particular, uh, in this talk, we will focus on what are called liveness properties, uh, more on those later. So what is this uh, uh, k-context-bounded analysis? So we say that uh, a run is k-context-bounded if any thread is swapped in at most k times. Right? So, uh, so this is uh, under, under approximation of the system behavior, but uh, it has been found useful in practice. and. Uh, uh, this is not very new in the sense that it's been done since the early 2000s. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a theorem by Atik Bojani and Kadir who show that uh, with this restriction of K context boundedness uh, for some fixed K, um, the global state reachability problem, uh, which is also known as just safety verification, right? So if you have a program and uh, there is some error, which is reflected as uh, some particular bit uh, in the global B, uh, memory being set to one. So this problem uh, is in two X space. So uh, this is what they showed. So uh, the question is, what about other properties, uh, uh, namely liveless verification? So uh, here in this paper, we considered uh, a two canonical liveness properties, namely that of non-termination and fair non-termination. So, uh, and we show that with uh, with this restriction of k-context boundedness, non-termination is 2x space complete, whereas uh, fair non-termination is decidable. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, the fair non-termination part, even though it's decidable, it's already as hard as fraternity reachability just for the case when uh, k equal to zero, right? So, there is no switching, it's just uh, threads running to completion. There's no interruptions. So, here is some sample code. 
to um, further see uh, how these things operate. So firstly, there is this shared uh, Boolean, global Boolean variable X, which is initially set to zero. And uh, also initially there are uh, these uh, two programs which are uh, uh, spawned, so which are A and out. So what does A look like? So here is the body of A. So uh, the first line says, if uh, the global variable X equal to zero, then spawn uh, a new instance of A and a new instance of B. So there is this dynamic uh, spawning of new threads uh, as we had seen. And then after that, uh, uh, this star, if, if star indicates some non-deterministic, uh, uh, non-determinism, which is there. So uh, we don't care where this comes from. It could be because uh, we leave certain things to implementation or however else uh, sometimes non-determinism turns up in the modeling. So if, uh, if star, then uh, call itself recursively. Right? So there is this uh, non-deterministically chooses whether to call itself or not. And once it returns, again, uh, it checks if x equal to zero and then it spawns a b and spawns an a. So the body of this program b is not of uh, concern to us right now, but uh, the body of this program out sets the global variable x to one. Right? So, uh, so what does uh, uh, the a configuration of this program look like? So firstly, there is this uh, the global state which is a set of uh, variable values assigned to the global variable. So here it's just x equal to zero. And uh, initially there is no uh, thread which is uh, which has started executing. There is just a couple of threads A and out which are pending and which need to be executed. So let's see what happens. So first uh, one of these pending threads, namely A is uh, started by the scheduler and it starts executing. So here uh, we are executing this first line of, of A as you can see by this arrow mark. And then uh, it spawns, uh, it, since X is equal to zero, so it spawns uh, a copy of A and B, which are added to these pending threads, as you can see. Um, and then uh, it makes uh, it makes a recursive call to itself at this point. So uh, you can see that uh, the stack size as indicated by these two boxes has now increased to two, right? So, um, so it, it's now again uh, executing this recursive call, which is, uh, which is now at line A1. And then uh, let's assume that the scheduler uh, pushes this thread out, right? And decides now to run some other thread. But now at this point, when uh, this thread is switched out, you see that uh, we have this one, number one, which is written in front of, uh, of this particular thread. So initially we start all these threads with uh, number zero, which indicates that uh, the number of switches that they have made, the number of context switches that they have made is zero. But whenever a thread uh, is getting executed and then it, it gets pulled out, switched out, then we increase this context switch number by one, right? So this has increased from zero to one. Um, whereas when you pull a thread in like this, so one of the pending thread A's has now become the currently executing thread and you see that the zero in front of it has not changed. So when it's switched in, you don't change it. When it's switched out, then you increase the number by one to keep track of how many switches have been made. So now uh, you see that uh, this is some arbitrary configuration where uh, you have some currently executing thread and then there are a lot of different pending threads. So some of them are uninitialized. Uh, many of them here are uninitialized, but there are also two threads which are inactive. They are not currently executing, but they have some stack, right? So there's one with uh, three stacks and there's one with four stacks. And in general, there are arbitrarily many threads with arbitrarily large stacks, right? So this is uh, why things get complicated as we shall see. So let's talk about the problems that we have in mind. So what is the non-termination problem? So in the context of this particular example, so you've given this, uh, this program, or you're given any program and uh, some bound K. And the question is, is there some K bounded non-terminating run? So is, is, there, is there a run where every thread is switched out at most K times, uh, but it's, it's basically an infinite run. So uh, in the setting of this example, uh, it turns out that the answer is yes, right? So you can just uh, keep spawning A's and B's and keep running them, right? So there are very many different, uh, uh, runs which can be non-terminating and go on forever. But uh, sometimes the non-termination is, is for very silly reasons in the sense that uh, suppose we impose the following condition, which is that of fairness, right? So we say that a fair run is one in which every pending thread must be eventually scheduled, right? So, uh, so here in this example, this means that this program out 
uh, which was spawned initially. This must be eventually it must be run. Or it must be chosen by the scheduler and run. So again, given a program and a bound k, the question of uh, fair non-termination is: Is there a k bounded fair non-terminating run? And uh, here there is no such k bounded fair non-terminating run uh, because as soon as you schedule out, so this will set uh, this variable x to one. So after this, uh, there is no way for uh, A to spawn any more uh, new tasks, right? Because it, it checks if X is zero. So if X is one, then it's not going to spawn any tasks. So there will be some number of tasks which are there uh, in, in, the, uh, in the buffer, in the task buffer, uh, pending threads, uh, pending uninitialized tasks, and all of the different things uh, will, will be run and then uh, they will uh, complete executing and the program will terminate. So, Ram, another question on that uh, uh, last slide. The, yeah. So, I mean, if it is a fair, can you, I mean, if you have, let's say, two processes, can you have a fair uh, execution that is non terminating and uh, K bounded? Uh, so, here in this setting, we, uh, we don't have it, right? Because uh, this out must be scheduled. In this example, no, you I, must I'm have any some... program, not, not this program. Uh, I mean, I mean if, if you have if, two threads, then one of, I mean, assuming that they don't block, I mean, they'll have like one is, one will always be pending. And so we'll have to always context switch at some point. And you can't do it more than K time. So how do you have a non-terminating run? I, I mean, you could have non-terminating runs for, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, with a single thread, in fact, which we would rule out, um, uh, which, can, which we can easily rule out. So for example, you could just have, uh, I mean, you could just have this A making uh, recursive calls to itself all the time, right? So, uh, yeah, no, no, so, suppose, so those suppose, things suppose you- Two or more threads, suppose I have two or more threads. So, but you would have, right? I mean, uh, uh, you would have, uh, so, so I don't, I, I think I don't understand your question. Uh, so there is a possibility. So it depends on what the scheduler does, right? So, so is, is there, so do you, do you want, you are talking about with the fairness condition? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, does it make sense to say, I mean, and for a general program that mm -hmm. it is, you know, K-bounded and you're looking for a fair non-terminating run. I mean, it seems that that is ruled out, right? No, but uh, so so the point is, uh, so there are, even though you can, you see that uh, you have these uh, intermediate programs which have built up stacks, right? Mm. So, I mean, you would have to schedule these also again at some point, right? So even though, uh, even if you have two programs, like the kind of different stacks that you end up with is, is unbounded. I mean, you would have like different kinds of threads which are there. Okay, maybe maybe I'm missing something. Maybe it'll get clear when you're going to go ahead. Uh, could I ask a related question? Uh, sure. Uh, even in, even with a single thread like this, uh, couldn't the thread keep recursing through the A2, through the instruction A2? Yes. So so that's yeah. possible. But but the point is, uh, so those kinds of things are things that are uh, easy to detect, right? So if you have a uh, a push down and you want to know whether uh, it can it can uh, uh, it can have an just a single push down can have a non terminating run then this would only happen when you can uh, build up a, a positive run by uh, increasing the stack height going from with a loop on a particular state right so this you can detect easily so in that sense uh, so in this setting we are not interested in what a single program does right so we are more interested in uh, termination or non-termination because of this interaction uh, between you know uh, different programs as they get yeah, scheduled. Yeah. And swapped so in. Yeah, we're assuming that uh, in the single threads will always terminate if they're not uh, interleaved. Yeah, right? uh, yeah. So, so in that sense, uh, you can say that we assume that single threads are always going to terminate okay. because you can you can easily figure out whether a single thread is uh, is going to keep running forever. Right, because if it uh, if there is a way that uh, there is some state Q and then uh, it it keeps pushing and then uh, there is a point at which uh, both the the top of the stack symbol and the state are the same, so then that is when it's going to uh, sort of keep on going. Right, so you can easily figure out whether uh, this uh, for a single thread whether this contamination happens or not.
So whenever you have whenever you have an autumnating run of, of like a single pushdown, then you must have uh, this, this kind of thing, right? So you must have a stack, you must have a configuration uh, where this where the top of the stack symbol is some gamma, and then you have some Q, and then uh, there is uh, you have uh, you increase the stack height further, you add uh, some more stack symbols, and then again you reach the same so-called surface configuration, right? Q comma gamma. So this is the only way in which if you just have a single uh, Q that you can keep going forever. Sorry, Ramnathan, question. Like, yeah. when you say single thread, you mean a single process or like, because it can spawn new threads, no? Yes, yes. So what I, what I mean is, what I mean is suppose there is no uh, context switching, Right, so so there is a point after which there is only one program which keeps on running. Right, so uh, so in that setting, I'm saying that uh, that kind of non-termination would would happen where you don't care about like what other things are there, but there is just a single program which has just taken over control and it keeps running forever. So that is sort of easy to spot. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because so the, at that level, our a single program here is is just uh, it's just uh, it's just a push down. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, so this was yeah, this was more to uh, just show that uh, you know what is this distinction between uh, the non termination and this fair non termination where. Uh, you insist that uh, if every thread must be eventually scheduled. So, uh, so Deepak, have I answered your question, or I mean, is that still some confusion as to what is the uh, is, about the model? Or... About, but I think you go ahead, Drama. I'm, I'm sure I'm, okay. I'm missing something, and I'll, I'll get it when as you go. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so in the rest of this talk, basically, uh, we'll show the firstly uh, that uh, the non-termination problem is in two x space by uh, abstracting this behavior of, of these threads as languages, and then applying uh, the so-called downward closure abstraction, and finally redu reducing the problem to one about vector addition systems with states. So this is the this is one part. And then uh, we will show that the fair non-termination problem is decidable, and we'll, we'll see uh, why the techniques that we use for the first problem do not apply in this case, namely the obstacles, and then we give some proof outline. So uh, let's dive into this. So here is a picture of sort of a, a generic run of, of uh, the entire uh, program with uh, context bound k equal to two, right? So, so here there are three threads, uh, and for each thread, uh, the diagram shows how the stack height changes, right, uh, along with time, right? So, so here first, uh, there is only one thread initially, um, and the global state is some G naught. So this, star, this uh, thread starts running, and then it, it, at some point, it spawns uh, a blue task, right? And then further, it may spawn a red task, and another red task, and another blue task. Uh, and finally, at uh, this particular point in time, when the global state is G1, it gets interrupted by the scheduler. And uh, one of the tasks, red tasks that uh, it spawned takes control over uh, at this global state G1 and it starts running. So then it produces uh, its own tasks, uh, some two red tasks and two blue tasks. And uh, the, again, it, uh, the scheduler swaps out uh, this uh, second thread and uh, the, the control goes back uh, to the first thread, right? So, so there is this uh, gap, G1 to G2, where uh, you know, there is this, uh, where the first thread got switched out at G1 and it got switched in at uh, G2 again. Right? And uh, again, the, the run goes on and uh, there are other threads which are, uh, there is a third thread which starts running. And uh, at some point in time, uh, the control was returned to the first thread and then it terminates. So the, the, the stack is, is, uh, goes to zero and the, the first thread terminates. So at this point, notice that uh, uh, inside the task uh, buffer, um, there's a number of uninitialized tasks which are still there. And there's also this uh, thread two and thread three, which have started running, but uh, which got interrupted. Um, and uh, in for all of these three threads, uh, the number of times they got interrupted was at most two, right? So, so far this run uh, is, uh, is a run such that the context bound of K equal to two is respected, right? 
so uh, so so what what is this diagram about let us focus on on a single thread just the first thread uh, that we saw so what does its behavior look like right so so this is what it looks like so it it starts at some g0 and then it produces some spawns and then uh, it's interpreted g1 then at g2 it continues produces some more things and then g3 g5 produces some more things and then finally at g6 it stops so here uh, we say that the type of this thread is the sequence of the global state changes that it goes through, right? So G0 and then uh, G1, G2, G3, G5, G6, right? All of these context switches. And uh, the spawn of, a, of this thread is, is basically uh, the sequence of uh, spawns that it makes. And uh, the language is, is the spawn words from all the possible executions, right? So you can, you can, uh, see that this is in fact a context-free language because you are considering a single thread. So this is just a push down. And uh, the crucial uh, fact uh, here is- Raman, I think I, uh, sorry, I don't understand what this G0, G1, G2 mean. So are they letters in some alphabet? If yes, so, no. So, so they are, uh, they are uh, global states. So, so if you have uh, some, uh, you had X, X0 equal to zero, uh, so there is some variable, global variable X, which is equal to zero. Right, so uh, you could have other global variables with different values. So if you consider the set of all of these different values, this gives you some global state of the whole program. So uh, that global state is just represented abstractly as some G0 and G1 and G2, right? So these are the, uh, the state of the, let's say global Boolean variables uh, when the program is uh, interrupted at various points. And continue. Okay. A, couple more, uh, a couple more related questions. Uh, only at the points of interruption, is it? So, yeah. So that is uh, that is basically what we use to uh, define the type of a thread. And what, what does the red and the blue mean? So you can just think of them as. Uh, so we are modeling. Uh, uh, so you, you, we are modeling this as a single thread as a pushdown. So. Uh, whenever it spawns a new task, you can think of it just as uh, a single top of stack symbol. So you can think of this blue and the red as two different top of stack symbols. So when it when you, when you think of the um, uh, when you think of um, the code, right? So you can you can think of uh, when you are spawning some new task, uh, the top of the stack symbol would maybe correspond to like the line number inside some particular program. So there is some finitely many uh, different such things, right? And uh, these are all the, there are some finitely many different kinds of tasks that you can spawn in this sense. So here uh, there are only two types, some red and some blue. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So red and the blue are the two different tasks that you can spawn. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, sorry, sorry. I have one more question. The Sure. Sure. The states, you assume a finite state space, is it? Because otherwise I can't see how yes. you get a CFL. Yes, yes. So, so the so the shared the shared global memory is assumed to be uh, finite. Okay. Yeah. So, so the infinite part of it is is really the the number of spawns that you can make, and also the number of different kinds of uh, stack configurations that you can have. So, these are basically the the infinite parts of the system. I mean, unbounded, not infinite, but unbounded. Yeah, I, I have a question. So, which is um, so? How do I read the pipe and the commas here? Maybe I'm just missing this. Thing. So, so it so the uh, the 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 thread started at G naught, right? And then mm -hmm. it ran till G one, right? At G one, it got interrupted by some other thread, and then it got restarted again at G two, and then it ran till, till G three, and then again it got interrupted. It got restarted at G five. Then okay. finally, it stopped at G six. Okay. Right. So now for every such type, you can produce, you can produce a pushdown automaton, which, and then that describes all the possible uh, spawn words, uh, which you can collect. And this, this gives you this language, which is a context free language. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So this is for so each uh, execution. That. This, the type is one sentence of that grammar, is it? So no, so the type is uh, the type is basically so here uh, you can think of you can make as many as k context switches, right? So, so the, the maximum number of context switches that a thread can make is k. 
So you can think of each of these G1, G2 is like one jump. So one like switch that has been made, right? And then similarly between G3 and G5, there was, there was this switch out and switch in which was made, right? So, uh, so if you have K context switches, you can have as many as K of these, right? So, so there is some finite uh, global uh, uh, shared memory. And there is also only uh, K many times that these switches can happen. So the total number of types of different threads that you have here is finite. It's all of these sequences of global states, which are uh, say 2K plus one long or whatever. Okay, plus uh, but, uh, so when I go from G1 to G2, the I don't know how the state changes, right? The other threads change it. So just from this thread's code, I cannot generate that sequence. It, it can be arbitrary. No, no, no. So so you have to think of this as the, uh, the way you would see this as a CFL is as following, right? So for the part from G0 to G1, you would have uh, some, uh, you have a push down, right? And then you can think of making an ex epsilon transition from G1 to another copy of the of a similar push down into a state G2 right so this is this jump so you can you can think of so you have uh, if you didn't have any interrupts you would just have like a, a single push down which which told you how things work but when you have these k many different context switches then you can think of it as like k such push downs lined up with these connections from G1 to G2 which is like a epsilon transition And then similarly from G3 to G5, which is another epsilon transition and so on. So you can put together all of these to get like one big PDA, uh, which describes what kind of things, what kind of uh, different spawns can be made by a thread when it has a certain kind of uh, interruption pattern. So this epsilon transition would go to all possible target global states because you don't know. No, it, yeah, it would go from, uh, if you once you fix this type, then the epsilon transition will go from G1 to G2, right? So, so just think of G0, G1, there is one, one push down, right? And then at some point from, so, so the initial state will be in, in this particular push down, and then you will have another copy of this same push down, where from the first copy of the push down from the G1 in that copy to the G2 of the next copy, there will be an epsilon transition, right? But the G2 is and not- then, the G2 is not unique, right? From G1, I could go to G3, G I could go to so many other possible. No, I but don't know this you have fixed. So you have fixed. So this is this you're saying that, that this is the type of this thread, right? So you're you're saying, suppose there's a thread which behaves in this way, it makes certain sequences of jumps. Then for that fixed sequence of jumps, we can describe like what is the spawning behavior that it will produce by a single PD. I'm not following because the type G2, the state G2 is not in my hand, but in some other threads. It's the it's the control of some other thread. It arbitrarily. No, no. This is this is not this is not about control or or it, it is just describing uh, what are the possibilities of spawning for a particular thread if it follows given condition conditioned on the fact that it follows certain jumps. No, I'm still not getting it, but I think I should let you proceed. Maybe we will come back to it. Thanks. Okay. So uh, Raghavan, maybe I can clarify. He's, he's saying that you, you fix a sequence G0, G1, G2, right? You fix a sequence for yeah, that thread, yeah, right? Yeah. And now you ask what is the uh, you know spawning behavior of that, uh, assuming that it is- uh, But how can I fix the sequence? The, the, the sequences can be arbitrary. It can be arbitrary, yeah. We don't, so, but-, but let's, he, He's calling it type of a thread, so it's not unique then. A thread will not have a unique type. Yeah, I mean, this seems to be less to do with the- uh, thread, but I mean, it's more like fix this property of this thread and then you can ask what is the spawning language. Yeah. So given some thread, which has this, you know, this look at this, what are the jumps that it makes? Then uh, from that, you know that uh, you can tell what are the different spawns that it will make, different spawning words that will be produced by it. So the spawning word is essentially the other threads that it's creating when when they yeah the uninitialized uh, tasks so if you look at uh, blue as a and red as b then uh, you can think of this as a b b a a b b a a b b mm -hmm. right so this is some word right okay okay so here i mean uh, if you wanted to include the the context information then you would say like you know uh, you would add a index like comma 1 for the for the first set then like a comma 2 for the for the second set of things 
and comma three for the second, the other set of things. Right? So you would have, uh, you could also say like in, in which particular uh, context or which particular segment was this spawn created? So you, you could also include that information. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, so sorry, Ramnathan, like just, uh, uh, are you using the cursor because we do not see it? Uh, no, I am not using the okay, cursor. Okay. Um, no, no, no. It's just a question. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So maybe. Yes, yes. Can you now see the can. cursor? Yes, yes you can. Yes. Okay. I see. Maybe it would help if this cursor was larger. No, no. Ah, it was visible now, just now. Yeah. Okay, maybe let me just. Uh, uh, yeah, it would have. Maybe it would have helped if I had made this cursor uh, larger, and then I could have pointed at stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, so, so the crucial uh, observation here is that uh, when when you are looking at non-termination of a program, then uh, you can just forget some spawns. So, I mean, it could be the case that you lose out on some of these spawns, but you still uh, manage to reach the state G six. And uh, conversely, suppose there is a way to uh, reach uh, this uh, target state G6, global state G6, uh, when you have lost certain spawns, then there is some corresponding run of, uh, of the original system where you don't lose the spawns, which would still reach G6. So, uh, so basically by losing these spawns, you create an over approximation of the system behavior, but which preserves the property of non-termination. So, uh, so this is basically uh, the abstraction that we use, which is called uh, the down closure abstraction. And uh, so this allows you to replace this uh, context-free language of a thread by a regular language, uh, by what is called Haynes' theorem, which says that the down closure of any language is, is regular. And in fact, for a context-free language, we can uh, compute this. So this follows from uh, just the fact that the subword order is, is a well quasi order. But, uh, just take it from me that uh, when when you lose these spawns, then uh, you can what you get the new system that you get. This is a regular system. Sorry, so uh, just, uh, uh, once you uh, sorry, sir. just a question. So what do you mean by losing a spawn? Maybe I, I could not losing uh, losing a spawn. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean by that? Like so so you have spawn? suppose uh, suppose you have uh, so in this setting so you have a push down automaton which which makes uh, some. Uh, it, which makes some state change. It could do some stack operation. And while doing so, uh, it also say spawns this new, uh, sub spawns a new task, this red mm -hmm. task or blue task, right? Mm -hmm. So now you can, uh, you can, instead of this, you can think of it as, uh, you know, it, it does this, whatever it does on the stack, you allow it to do that, but without spawning this, uh, this red task, right? Okay. So in that sense, you can also think of it as uh, there are, some of these spawns are just thrown away. They don't get added to the task properly. Okay. Yeah. So, so this, this gives you... Sorry, sorry. Uh, do you mean you look at all subwords of a spawn word or... Correct. So, so in, in from the from a language theory sense, you can think of it okay. as uh, you're looking at all the subwords of the spawn word. And uh, we know that whenever you apply this uh, down closure operation under the subword order uh, to some arbitrary language, then you would get a regular language always. Um, and in some cases, you know how to compute this, and you know how large it will be as well. So, in the setting for when it's a context-free language, then you know how to compute this uh, this regular language, and uh, you know that uh, we will see that basically it will be uh, exponentially larger uh, in size. So if you have like some description of this of this PDA, then uh, the corresponding down closure language will be given by uh, an NFA, which is uh, there is a lower bound which is exponential, and it can be done with that much. So so basically this is tight. So, uh, so, but the so the point is, once you have this, uh, this, uh, you know, you you replace this PDA with this uh, uh, with this automaton. So then, what you have is a regular thread. So you have some global state, and now this uh, state of this whatever thread is executing is is only one of some finitely many states. So now uh, you only need to keep counters for uh, each of these, right? So so for 
for every state and uh, for every switch number. So there are finitely many states and there are some k different switch numbers. So for each of these, you have a counter, right? Which tells you uh, how many of the programs are in which of these. And uh, so now in this setting, what you can do is one thing you can do is you can change the state of the uh, executing thread. Uh, of course, at the same time, it can spawn something. So here there is some new blue thread, which is spawned. So you see that the counter here uh, corresponding to the blue state and switch number zero gets incremented. And the other thing you can do is of course, switch out. So here you take this purple uh, thread and you switch it in. So this, you can see that uh, we retain this context number of one, whereas the switched out green thread, uh, it gets added to this counter green comma one, because when you switch it out, then you have to increase the, the context switch number. So basically when you have a regular thread, uh, then you can just uh, simulate this whole thing using a vector addition system with states, right? Because you just have some global state and you have some finitely many counters. And uh, this is basically a Petri net or, or a vector addition system with states. And uh, the, as I mentioned, there is this exponential blow up when you convert uh, some context free language to a regular language. So and uh, together, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, the, count, the counters represent the number of context switches, is it? The counter no. values? So, 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 the, so the counters represent, so think of, so you have an NFA, right? So now, uh, so a program is being represented by an NFA. And uh, you can, it, it's also there in some particular state of this NFA. So the NFA, there are only some finitely many states, right? So, uh, so every program that you have is going to be uh, in a particular state of some particular, this particular NFA, the down closure NFA that you built. So this means that uh, all of the programs that you have, uh, they, they all have, they can only be in one of these finitely many states, right? So, so the so the the uh, behavior of the entire system can be captured simply by counting how many programs are there in in different states of this NFA, the down closure NFA. Okay, so that can, that is unbounded. That the number of uh, the number of yeah. programs. Yeah. 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 I mean, so that could be that could be that is unbounded. Yeah. So you just have some unbounded counter for that. So which is why you have this uh, Petri net or a, or a VAS, right? So you have. You have one counter for every combination of a state and the context switch number. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, so uh, as I mentioned, when you when you uh, sort of uh, take this PDA and then construct this corresponding NFA from it. Uh, which assumes that you can throw away some part of the language, then you get this exponential blow up. And uh, together with the uh, known X space uh, algorithm for non termination of VAS, this gives you a two X space algorithm for the non termination. So, uh, so that concludes our description of the two X space algorithm for uh, non termination, for K bounded non termination. So now uh, we know that we can show that uh, fan non-termination is decidable, but uh, we need so, to uh, use some different maybe technology. Maybe I should, uh, uh, maybe since I still have this doubt, maybe I should ask you now. So yeah. can you give me an example of a, of a two thread system, uh, which, is, which uh, doesn't terminate on the K bounded? So, so you mean with, with the fair termination, fair non-termination condition? Oh, sorry, you're not assuming fair non-termination, right? Oh, sorry, that's the second one. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. So the first one, okay, first one I'm, I'm okay with, okay. Uh, so uh, now I'm, I'm a little... Uh, <laughs> okay, sorry. No, uh, I, the, so in the first problem, you're not looking at the fair, uh, you're not looking at fairness, right? Yeah, so, so in, the, in, the, in, the first, in the first case, you just have non-termination. And uh, in, in the second case, you have uh, you have you consider fairness. So you need mm -hmm. what you need is that uh, whenever you have uh, uh, whenever there is some some particular program which can be so uh, if you if you think of the global uh, state changes that take place, some say Q to Q prime, right? So if if there is if this this happens and then there is a certain program which on this particular state change can actually uh, make a transition. Then um, you you must uh, you must schedule this program at some point. 
Okay, so is it? Easy? So and this 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 is for uh, for every uh, for every uh, program. So here, so uh, at this point, we haven't we have not talked about uh, we are not looking at like program IDs, right? So uh, so if you have suppose you have like uh, some uninitialized task. Suppose you have some A which is uninitialized, and you have some four instances of it, right? So fairness only demands that like one of these should be run at some point. So we don't consider we're not looking at the IDs, but suppose. One of these A's has uh, become a thread, right? So uh, you have it has it has been initialized and then it has run for a while and then it has created its own thread. So then uh, at some future point, if it can run, it should be allowed to run. So this is what this is how we consider fairness. Okay. So uh, can you give me an example of a simple two-threaded system that does not terminate under k-bounded and fair assumption? um well, yes i mean you could just uh, you could just have them uh, make a make a uh, make a step and then pass control to the other one right back and forth Oh, you mean like with the? You mean along with the k boundedness? Right, right, right. So yeah, so then you need uh, you would need them to also spawn uh, other tasks, right? So suppose you have two threads which are building up stacks of their own, but they are also spawning uh, at the same time as they are making moves. They are also spawning other threads. So mm -hmm. are you allowing the spawning of other threads, or is that not allowed? I mean, I think even if you don't have spawning of other threads, I can't see how. No, if you don't have spawning of other threads, then you there are only two threads, so you must like there is no other place for it to switch to. So then, of course, if you bound the number of switches, then then there is no way. But if you have, uh, if you have, so initially you start with suppose you start with just two threads, but then you have yeah. some additional tasks which are spawned. So under fairness, they will also be executed at some point. Uh, so then you can you can build something where uh, you can sort of take a round robin and go over uh, different tasks and keep executing them, but then you will have like a non-terminating system. No, but wouldn't I have had done more than case switches? If I do a round robin. No, but so you have to keep on producing more and more tasks, right? So no, so you have like that, I mean, that doesn't affect the fact that I'm doing a switch, right? I'm, I, I mean, I, aren't I allowed only case switches totally? Or, or, no, it's no, 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 no. This I is case switches. Part... This is case switches per thread. Per thread. Oh. This is every thread is allowed case switches. Okay, okay, okay. Then then it's okay. I think that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So um, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't see where you were coming from either. Um, yeah, so every thread is allowed case switches. So in fact, in the example that we considered, we saw the when when I said k equal to two, right? And then I showed this global picture. So the okay, first so, thread itself had made two switches. Okay. So and then the second you, and third threads had also made some right. switches. Okay, so, so the total number of switches spawning. in that picture was some five, mm -hmm. and k was two. Okay. So if you don't allow spawning, you cannot have a. A k bounded fair non terminating execution is that correct? Yeah, when you have only two okay, things, sorry. yeah, because okay. you have two. The only thing you can switch from one is the other one, right? So then, if you bound yeah. that, then you cannot have. Okay, it. that clarifies. Okay, thanks. So, uh, so in this um, setting, in for the fair non termination, we will see that uh, this sort of losing of spawns doesn't work, and we need a different abstraction, which is that of semilinearity. And then we will show how to augment uh, vector addition systems with states with uh, like an additional structure called balloons in order to capture semilinear sets. But then we will see how to produce fair uh, finite witnesses of fair non-termination. And uh, we will reduce it to reachability in this new model. And finally, reduce the reachability in this new model to uh, reachability in regular VAS, uh, thus giving us the desirability proof. So what is the obstacle? So here, uh, this is not fair non-termination uh, is not preserved under lost spawn. So in particular, you cannot just, uh, you cannot throw this out uh, program out of the window. So, I mean, it needs to be run at some time, which means that we don't have any regular equivalent, uh, which, which will preserve this, this particular property. So in particular, uh, you have this unbounded number of waiting threads and uh, there is this tax size of each thread, which is also unbounded. 
and uh, obviously now if you want to keep a counter for each of these different things uh, this will require an unbounded number of counters so you cannot model this using a normal bus so uh, so what do we do um, so what is this uh, semilinear representation of language uh, sorry uh, ramanathan could you just uh, yeah. go back and uh, say once more why do you need unbounded number of counters uh, because of because, unbounded uh, waiting threads because now we cannot uh, you cannot replace this pda with a with a, a regular uh, with a regular like a, a normal mm -hmm. automator right so in the case of a dfa or nfa you have only some finitely many states so every program in that setting can only be in one of those finitely many states and then you are counting how many different uh, programs are in which of these different states along mm -hmm. with the context switch number so you can just keep uh, say the total number of lines of code times k so maybe this many numbers will suffice for you to count once you have like a, a regular program which will preserve the property uh, that you are looking at so in this setting there is no regular equivalent program which will preserve mm -hmm. this property of fair count combination mm -hmm. so this means that now if you just retain this the pda as such then uh, you have these threads each of these threads could have some arbitrary size stack right so now if you want to count so this means that the state space of of these programs is unbounded right so which means that you can't have just some finite number of counters which tells you that uh, you know there are for this particular stack, there are you know so many programs in the, with this particular stack and so on. If you look at all the different stacks that are present, mm -hmm. okay. So so what we observe here is that uh, in a particular context, right? So when when a program is running from G naught to G one, so it, this is uninterrupted part of its run, right? So here the ordering of the spawns within this particular context doesn't matter. So this means that instead of looking at this word, you can just look at this vector, right? So you can just uh, think about how many of these different tasks are getting spawned in each of these different uh, contexts. So now uh, we still retain this type of a thread as, as uh, defined to be the sequence of global states that it goes through. But instead of this spawn word, you have this spawn vector. And uh, we know that this particular vector is the element of some fixed semilinear set. So, so what's a semilinear set? So, uh, roughly speaking, you can think of it as finite unions of uh, sets, which which can be described by a base vector, uh, along with some multiples of some finite collection of period vectors. Right. So here, this particular vector could be belonging to this semilinear set, which is described by this base vector and this particular period vector. So, uh, so. There is uh, this famous theorem by Parikh, which says that any uh, context-free language, uh, when you when you when you just look at the numbers number of uh, letter occurrences, which is what we mean uh, when we say commutatively equivalent, so then it, this is basically a semilinear set. So if you look at the number of times a particular letter is occurring and look at produce these vectors uh, out of this language, then this collection of vectors form a, forms a semilinear set. So uh, later we will see that this property of similarity enables us to do this uh, thing which we call token shifting between balloons. And uh, so this technique of token shifting will not apply if you take some more complicated language. For example, if you take some higher order pushdown language uh, for which uh, this Parikh's theorem does not, uh, uh, is not true. So then we cannot apply uh, these techniques anymore. So, uh, so we have seen what is the what is the abstraction that we are using in this setting instead of the downward pressure abstraction. So, let us see how we can augment a vector addition system with states uh, to accommodate these semilinear sets. So, uh, so what are these things? So, you have some global state, and you have some uh, counters. So, this part of it is just like a regular uh, bus. But in addition, you have these unboundedly many balloons, and uh, each of these balloons themselves contain some bus counters. Some uh, again, some fixed number of different counters are possible. And additionally, there is some finite set of states that each balloon can take. So now you have the usual bus operation. So you can uh, decrement uh, and increment counters as before. So here you removed one green token and added one uh, pink token. In addition, we have the following balloon operation. So you have, uh, you can create or inflate a, a new balloon. So here we have created uh, the balloon, blue balloon, which has been outlined in red, uh, with with a vector from an associated semilinear set. So you you have some particular semilinear set from which you pick a vector, and then you can fill this balloon with that particular vector. 
So uh, then we have this deflate operation. So here uh, it says that suppose there is a balloon with some particular state, uh, say blue, then uh, take uh, the magenta uh, counters and push them onto the vast counters. So basically you see that there is two here. And then uh, now this, this blue balloon, it got deflated. So it's, it's state changed to red by the outline color. And uh, there is this blue token, uh, uh, which got, uh, so sorry, this pink token, which got shifted on. So now there are three over here instead of two, right? So, and then we also have this burst operation where you can just take a balloon and get rid of it. So these are the three balloon operations. And uh, so how do we uh, get, uh, how do we model these programs or how, how, what do we, how do we use these balloons? So you have this form vector and uh, you can represent this as a stratified balloon with these like three different sections. So in fact, uh, you can just think of, instead of sectioning, you can just uh, use different colors, right? You can have some additional uh, counters in order to represent the different sections, right? So clearly here, this is the spawns of the, of the first context of the thread and second context and, and so on. So uh, as I said, implemented using uh, additional colors. So here the, the type of a thread uh, can be uh, captured using the color of this balloon, the outline of this balloon. And uh, the spawn vector is basically its contents. So now we have the following correspondence between uh, programs and the vast with balloons. Namely, if you have some thread which must be eventually scheduled uh, in, in fairness, so then uh, every balloon must eventually be deflated. So the global states of the program will be captured by the global states of the VASB. Uh, the newly spawned inactive threads, uh, so there are only finitely many of these, remember, because these don't have any non-trivial stack associated with them. So these can just be captured using counters. And uh, the, the spawn vector of a thread can be captured using balloon contents. So how do we, uh, let us see how in this example, how we can model this. So uh, to simplify this further, we just remove a couple of these spawns. So here in this program, notice that if you have some A which runs, then it will spawn some A to the N, B to the N for some number N. So depending on how many times it makes this recursive call at A2, uh, that many that, that will decide what this number N is, right? But uh, however, not all of these spawns can may occur in the same context so because we have these interruptions. So it could spawn a bunch of A's, but then it could get interrupted and then it could spawn these later and so on. So uh, now we will show how like a run of this program corresponds to run of uh, VAS with balloons, but we will only show the counters and balloons because the, the global state is just captured by the global state. So first uh, we had this scenario where you had nothing which is running. There is just an A and an out, which are uninitialized tasks. So now the A got initialized, right? So uh, corresponding to this in a vast with balloon, initially there will be like these two uh, tokens, one green and one uh, black uh, for A and out. And uh, switching in this thread uh, means uh, that we decrement this green counter. So we are just left with this black, black one. So next, uh, what we do is we guess the spawns that can be made in each segment. So for the purposes of this example, we assume that K is just is one, right? So there are only, uh, it's only swapped out and swapped in once. So there will be only uh, two, two segments or, or uh, two contexts for, for each thread. So here uh, we have guessed that uh, this A which started running, we have guessed that it will, uh, it will produce two A's and then it will get interrupted. And then uh, after that, it will produce two Bs in, in the, the second time it switched in. So this is represented by this balloon over here, right? So the two A's and then it gets interrupted and then two Bs, right? So, uh, so, it, uh, so this is what happens. So it runs and then it, it produces these two A's. And uh, of course, then the, the stack uh, now has to be of size two because it has made this like recursive call. And uh, now uh, we can deflate this balloon, right? So we can take these, uh, the green tokens and, and put them onto the VAS counters, right? So you remove them. And uh, also you, you see that this balloon state from red, it has become purple, right? So uh, next uh, you see that uh, this gets swapped out. That's what we guessed that uh, this, uh, the A would get swapped out. And instead this other uh, A over here, uh, so one of them gets swapped in. And uh, so corresponding to that, again, we decrement this particular green counter here. So now let's assume that this uh, newly swapped in A runs to completion, producing yet another A and B. 
right? So it doesn't make any recursive calls, it just runs to completion. So corresponding to this, we can have a balloon of this form, right? So it there is it produces one A and B in the in the first segment, and the second part is just empty. So it just uh, it just runs to completion. So now uh, we can just empty uh, both of these onto onto the vast counters, and then it uh, you get this empty balloon, which can just be burst, right? So at this point. Notice that uh, we have the following equivalence, right? So you have these counters which correspond to the uninitialized tasks, and then uh, there is this particular thing uh, which will in future produce. Uh, we have guessed that it will produce uh, uh, two blue or two uh, bees. It will spawn two bees. So there is this balloon to represent that, right? So uh, so it makes two more bees, and then we deflate this, and then uh, so at this point. Uh, let's say that out gets uh, swapped in, it will set uh, X to one, and then no more things are spawned and the, the program terminates. So similarly here, uh, you will just have that you have some number of counters and uh, this was will also stop. So so this, uh, uh, hope I hope this gave you some idea of how, how this uh, simulation of, of, this, uh, of this program with this VASU balloons works. So now let's look at how to get finite witnesses of fair non-termination. So uh, the normal, uh, the usual idea for uh, saying that, uh, you know, finding a finite witness for, for an infinite run is that uh, that of self-covering run, right? So basically, if you look at this particular uh, sequence of transitions, so there is some global state G4 here, which is the same here. And uh, the counters here, the values are strictly dominated uh, are dominated by uh, by these values here, right? So this uh, enables you to uh, take this particular part of the run and keep applying it, right? So you can apply whatever transitions you applied here. You can apply once again to this uh, this configuration, uh, and uh, so you get this infinite uh, unrolling, right? So this is uh, this is how uh, you normally get uh, a finite witness uh, for an infinite run. In, in the case of us, but now we have these extra balloons, right? So now what do we do? So uh, the idea is that we guarantee that there is a run where there are infinitely many configurations with only empty balloons. So how does this happen? Um, so, so I mean, if, if you could do this, then of course, uh, you know, uh, you can, now you have these, all of these balloons are just empty, right? So you can just think of them as additional tokens, right? Because there is no more, additional structure to them. So you can just think of this as a blue token and this as a red token. So it, it reduces to the case of pass, right? So uh, so now what we do is, um, so first we look at, in order to get this, this kind of thing where you have uh, empty balloons all over the place. So let's look at what are the infinitely appearing colors in, uh, in the infinite run, right? So here you have this uh, purple colored balloon, which is there. Uh, which appears for some time in this run row, but uh, after a particular point in time, it does not appear again. So there is some finite prefix where different kinds of things could happen, but uh, but then there is this infinite suffix where only certain kinds of things appear. Right? Similarly, this this uh, pink tokens will up, could appear, but then later on they disappear. So here we have uh, these uh, infinitely appearing token colors, which are uh, green and purple, and infinitely appearing balloon colors, which are uh, blue and red. Right. So now, uh, so let's look at uh, just this infinite suffix where you have only these uh, blue or red tokens, and we do the following. So first, uh, we make uh, uh, we pick one balloon for each color, and create a particular segment. So let us say that this is the uh, ith segment. So the the how is this ith segment defined? So you have the corresponding burst operations for these two balloons, right? So these balloons were inflated here, and uh, those particular balloons were deflated here. They got burst here, right? So, um, so, so we for uh, so this defines this segment i. And once the last of the balloons that you picked have, have been burst, then starting from there, you define another the next segment, right? So here again, you pick uh, one blue and one uh, red balloon, and then again these are the corresponding bursts, right? So now uh, we do the following. So let's look at this particular uh, balloon in, in segment I uh, outlined in green. So this uh, this is not one of the balloons we picked. So what we will do is we will take the tokens which are there in this particular balloon and shift it to segment I minus one. So we just 
send it off there, right? So what does this mean? So now look at segment I plus one. So here there are these two balloons, which we did not pick. They have some tokens. So what we will do is we will take the tokens of these balloons and put them in the balloons that we picked uh, of the same type in segment I. Okay? So we move them like so, right? So, uh, and why is this possible? It's possible because uh, of similarity, right? So uh, uh, we know that, so modulo, so just assume for a moment that this base vector is zero. So it's just, uh, there is just some period vector and the, vector that you have is some multiple of a particular period vector. Then uh, if you have like say two times the period vector and three times the period vector in two different balloons, you can add it up, you get five times the period vector. So this allows you to have five times the period vector in one balloon and the other balloon is empty, right? So this is basically what we do. So another thing we have to argue is that this, whatever we did here gives an actual valid run. So there is this original run where uh, some of the balloons uh, might have transferred their tokens in this segment number i plus one, but now we have shifted all of these uh, all of these tokens to the previous uh, segment, right? And uh, these balloons, uh, we know that they got deflated and then they got burst uh, before segment i plus one began. So this means that uh, all of these things which got uh, uh, offloaded, all of these tokens which got offloaded in segment i plus one in the original run, already got offloaded in, in uh, segment I in, in this new run, right? So, so firstly, notice that we have not, uh, all of the balloon operations are kept basically the same, right? So uh, that we are not modifying any of those, so that is okay. So now the, the only thing is the, the counter operations. So now we see that if you just look at the counters, then uh, clearly there is this, uh, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll just quickly run over. Um, so this is by uh, monotonicity of bus that uh, this is enabled. So uh, so after token shifting, we see that uh, all of these balloons are empty. And uh, this particular configuration over here, uh, we have burst the balloons which we picked in segment type. And uh, all of the rest of the balloons, the, the tokens were shifted away. So basically this means that this contains only empty balloons. So thus we have these infinitely many configurations with only empty balloons and uh, we will get our self-covering run. Additionally, we can pick uh, these configurations far away so that uh, we can satisfy the fairness condition. So, and it's not difficult to see that this search for this witness can be reduced to reachability in BASB. Uh, so now we just have to uh, see how reachability in VASB can be reduced to reachability in VAS. So what we want is a VASB run containing only a bounded number of non-empty balloons. So as soon as you have this, it's uh, you can reduce this to a VAS. Uh, so uh, in order to do this, we see that uh, whatever we did previously, uh, it does not work because uh, this finite prefix where uh, arbitrary things can happen, and then followed by this infinite suffix is such that this finite prefix can be very large. Uh, we don't have any bound on like when uh, this will stop, right? So this means that we need to modify this, uh, our token shifting argument to work for finite runs. And uh, so for this, we define the notion of similar balloons, right? So suppose you have two balloons like this, uh, B1 and B2, which are with the same color, inflated with the same color, and then uh, B1, is deflated first, changing to red, and B2 is also deflated uh, by the same deflate operation, again, changing to red. And uh, every, every operation that they perform, they perform in the same sequence, right? B1 first and then B2. So this means that these two are similar, right? So then uh, it's, it should be clear to you that the tokens which are inside B2 can be shifted to B1, right? So then the rest of the run, basically B2 is just empty and B1 uh, drops all of the tokens. So uh, again, this new run is valid by monotonicity. We need some combinatorial argument to guarantee that such simple balloons exist. And uh, we show that uh, this happens if the total number of balloons is above some particular threshold. So this threshold is only dependent, dependent on the particular VASB in question. So it's a function of only the description of this VASB. And uh, so this argument will then give this run, which has a bounded number of non-empty balloons. And uh, this can be simulated using a VASB. So uh, we also show in, in, in our Popel uh, 2021 paper that uh, there is a different problem called fair non-starvation, which is decidable. 
um, and uh, there are more details of these uh, combinatorial arguments, uh, which essentially uses Ramsey theory. Um, so to conclude, uh, we have shown that the non-termination problem K-bounded is, is two X space complete. The fair non-termination problem is decidable and in fact is uh, Ackerman complete. And uh, the fast salvation problem is also decidable by reduction to fair non-termination. And uh, to produce these decidability results, we had to uh, in, uh, introduce this new model, which is uh, a decidable extension of VAS, which we call VAS with balloons. And uh, we hope that uh, this VAS with balloons will uh, um, will be can be used in other places to model interesting phenomena. Thank you. So, uh, if there are more questions we, uh, or doubts, we, I could go back and explain some other things. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Ramnathan. So there were lots of questions in between, and uh, yeah. So, but, but yeah, are there more questions? Uh, let's wait for more questions. So, uh, yeah, maybe if there are no other questions I could ask. So, uh, Ramanathan, in your first, maybe I, if you can go back to the first uh, uh, result. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I guess if if you can somehow find that, I mean, there is a, there is a run where you're spotting an infinite number of uh, uh, threads, then that would be non-terminating, right? You can know, but I mean, you cannot, uh, I don't know what you mean by spawning. Uh, you cannot have one. Uh, so unless that program does not give up control, you would only have some finite number of threads spawned by one particular thread, right? Uh, why is that? Yeah, because so I mean, it, it, if it doesn't, yeah. if it if it gives up control. Uh... Yeah, if it gives up control and, and finally it gets terminated at some point. So during its lifetime, it would have produced some finite number of new tasks. Mm. Uh, uh, there's someone. Yeah, please go ahead. Over. Yeah, okay. So I, I was just wondering uh, that, uh, so you were talking mostly, uh, essentially talking about this uh, context bounded uh, threads, but uh, are there other kind, kinds of boundings? Like I've heard of something called scope bounded, though I don't know exactly. Uh, yes, one. so we, we but, haven't. Uh, yeah, we haven't um, like, yeah, we know that there are these other kinds of things. We haven't really thought about, uh, you know, how this would work. I um, so I think, I think there are some instances which would uh, basically reduce to the same thing here, right? Because, uh, I mean, so in our setting, since we have, uh, um, since we have many, uh, you have this spawning of threads being allowed. So uh, when, when, when something goes to, when a stack goes to zero, so uh, then you can just, uh, uh, you know, uh, and then it comes back, right? So it goes goes to zero and then you allow it to uh, come back up again. You can just think of this as like spawning a new task. Mm -hmm. So I think there are some cases of uh, other notions of bounding which would reduce to context bounding in this scenario, but we haven't explored uh, all of the different possibilities. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, I'm not in one question from me. So, yeah. towards the end, uh, so when you uh, when you were talking about reachability of VAS with balloons, and you reduced it to reachability on a VAS. Yeah. Right. So there is some hidden bound, right? As in, uh, if you want to reach, you can. Uh, it's enough to consider uh, so many number of balloons. Yeah. And check if you. It's like some kind of a cutoff. Uh, yeah, Western, so that uses right? uh, so so uh, so you see that uh, there was this notion of one balloon following another, right? So this one does an operation, this one does the same operation. This one does an operation, this one does the same operation, right? So right. when you have that kind of thing, you can shift uh, all of the tokens from the second balloon to the first balloon, right? So that's what I call this similar balloon. And uh, now, uh, in order to argue that in fact you will have such a case, uh, you need basically you need to, uh, you can talk about, uh, uh, 
you can so if you look suppose you have like two balloons and then they are spawned one b1 is spawned first and then b2 is spawned so in the first uh, suppose in the first deflation the first time they release tokens they are it's in the same it's in the same order so then you will denote this by a zero then next time suppose they do it in the opposite sense right so so b2 actually does it first and b1 does it after that so then uh, you uh, you represent this by a one right so now uh, you can represent this sort of uh, relationship between two balloons by a string which of uh, zeros and ones so which you think of as a color and now uh, if you if you look at like this on this large number of balloons and then draw this uh, diagram with these edges which are colored by how they correspond to each other uh, by ramsey theory you can find this uh, monochromatic subgraph of uh, of balloons which all behave with the same way uh, with respect to each other and then there we show that since the number of balloon states is the is is finite there is a way to sort of pretend that one balloon is actually the other balloon at certain points when when the states of the balloons match up so then by by doing that uh, you see this sequence right so there is some 0 1 1 0 there is a sequence uh, of of the behavior which goes first so now these sequences of ones which show where the behavior is inverted those things can be flipped so that this entire thing becomes 0 0 0 0 between these two balloons and then you get these two similar balloons where you can transfer the tokens so no no so my question was like uh, so what does this mean at the level of uh, the programs like is there some kind of a you know like a cut off like thing that you can tell on the programs uh, you see listen if i want to decide this non termination k bounded fair non termination then i can restrict myself to so many i don't know spawns or some such thing no so it's not spawns right ah. so here we are saying ah. that the number of non empty balloons is something right, right. so yeah. so the number of non empty balloons uh, but it does not say anything about um, so well actually in a sense it does right so so okay so uh, uh, a priori if you look at it the way we are seeing right now there is no bound on the number of spawns that a particular that a particular balloon is producing right so that is there uh but what you do know is that um uh, whenever you have like like a like an infinite run then you're going to have this run which is uh, also this finite witness which is self covering and uh, inside this uh, self covering run you know that uh, there are only some finitely many different kinds of uh, spawn vectors that can exist um so this is something that we use later on this property is something that we use later on but again uh, it just says something about finiteness right at this point so it's not clear that uh, i don't i don't see how you can say that uh, there is some ab absolute bound on the total number of uh, spawns no, no. that are produced no 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 i mean yeah so i was asking if there's something around that flavor like what is the bound exactly how does it translate to here yes but i get the i get the there is no direct way to relate that it's 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 more like i mean so the balloons each non empty balloon corresponds to a thread which is producing spawns right so essentially you are you're saying that uh, there are only so many threads which actually produce spawns so that that is that uh, connection okay 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 yeah okay thank you so are there other questions yeah. so let's uh, thank uh, ramnathan once again thank you thanks amol excellent talk thank, thank you thank you for yeah i i hope yeah, yeah.